In the wake of the USPSTF decision on aspirin for primary prevention, a lot of people have come out with all sorts of theories about how medical science ought to progress, what went wrong in this instance. I think many of them are missing the mark, so let me walk you through my thinking on this. I'm going to talk about medical reversal, and we've been studying this for quite some time now, maybe over 10 years at this point, and we've written a book, I'll put a link in the description, Ending Medical Reversal, which is literally on this topic. What is medical reversal? Well, to understand it, you need to first know how science should normally proceed. The way medical science should work is, and of course medical science is just one small subset of all of science, the way medical science should work is, we are in the business of developing tests, screening, interventions such as drugs, devices, procedures, surgeries that are all supposed to make you live longer or live better. And the way it should work is a scientist develops a hypothesis. They develop a model of how the body works, a theory of what might make it better. They develop a lot of circumstantial evidence that supports that theory, corroborates that theory that this should work. And then they go ahead and implement it. Nope, actually, they do the key study. They do a definitive study that asks whether the routine application of this test, this pill, this drug, this surgery actually makes you live longer and live better. And in general, that type of study is a randomized control trial. And you want it to have adequate power, adequate blinding. You want it to measure the endpoint you really care about, living longer, living better. You need all that. And then you go ahead and make the leap. And even with all this stringent safeguards, there'll still be some error rate. They'll still get some things wrong. That's the nature of statistical science. However, that error rate will be quite low. But what happens instead? I think too often in biomedicine, we get seduced by the mechanism. We get seduced by the novelty. There are a lot of people who are going to make a lot of money if you sell this product. And so they bring that product out prematurely. They develop the model. They develop the circumstantial evidence. And then they just debut the product without doing that gold standard testing. We just saw this with aducanumab. Is it going to make people with Alzheimer's live longer, live better? I don't know. Does it change beta amyloid plaque in the brain? Sure. Does that correlate with that? Maybe but let's just go ahead and debut it and start paying for it and start implementing it. And that is a perennial pitfall in biomedicine. And it's also been a perennial pitfall even in SARS-CoV-2. We leapt before we had evidence in so many fronts. Now, part of that might be reasonable, but part of that is also unjustified if you don't simultaneously try to remedy your lack of knowledge. So there's one phenomenon called replacement. That's where new practices replace the next thing. And then there's medical reversal, where you debut the practice prematurely, it exists often for decades, and then finally some brave investigator comes along and puts it to a rigorous test, and it often fails. It doesn't work. It is reversed. It's not that it was replaced with something better, it's that it was no better than what we did before. Why does reversal happen? Well, sometimes it's because you debuted the practice based on an underpowered phase two study. It didn't measure the endpoint you cared about. It didn't have the power. And then later you did a randomized phase three trial with adequate power on the endpoint you actually care about, and it doesn't work. Because underpowered phase two studies are both notorious for false negative results, but also false positive results. And here's a good example, Lartruvo. That sarcoma drug was debuted under accelerated approval based on an underpowered phase two, and lo and behold, the phase three trial didn't work at all and it was yanked from the market. The next common pitfall is extrapolating single center randomized control trial results to a multi-center context. Good examples of this are Manny Rivers early goal directed therapy, tight glycemic control in the uh, Netherlands. These studies, these practices, they appeared to work in some single centers with prominent spokespeople. But when you tried to scale that up to a multi-center study, the results evaporated. It didn't work. Some people say that this is just the normal way science proceeds. Well, that's not right, because the normal way science proceeds would be to take that pilot study and test it and then implement it. That would be a logical way to do it. But to implement it first and then conduct the definitive trials years later, that is a bit problematic in my mind. The other thing it points to is that um, some people say that, you know, it did work, but it didn't work. Science is just evolving. Actually, It may have worked at that one center, but that was never the relevant question. The question was always, could other places implement it and get the same results? And the answer is only tested by the multi-center trial and shows it doesn't. The other sort of classic pitfall we fall into is extrapolating beyond a study. A study showed something work in severe illness, people with certain inclusion criteria. We start extrapolating that to people beyond that initial inclusion criteria, and lo and behold, it doesn't work as well or doesn't work at all in some of those groups. It may even have harms outweighing benefits. The other way it doesn't work is randomized control trials are done, but they don't 
measure what you care about. They didn't measure the right endpoint. They used a surrogate endpoint. They had crossover when you didn't want it. They didn't have it when you did want it. They used a bad control arm. They have poor pros protocol care. I've written about this extensively in the book Malignant. And those are just a whole class of examples where even randomized trials can mislead. The other sort of classic way we fall into these pitfalls is um, we embrace something based on uncontrolled or historical evidence. We didn't have randomized data showing a benefit. We just had 50 people's experience tested against historical benchmarks. We thought it was better. We never did the randomized study. We just embraced it. The problem with that is historical benchmarks are often historical for a reason. Lots of other things were different in the past. We're going to improve upon historical benchmarks. Doesn't mean the intervention actually works. But the biggest class of reasons, the biggest reason we get so much flip-flopping, so much medical reversal, is we embarked on practices based on nothing other than mechanistic science and observational retrospective studies. We were so eager, enthusiastic, we just embarked on it. And human beings are quite good at doing that. We're an optimistic species. We love to embrace new things. We hope we can make our condition better. But when it comes to biology, that's very, very difficult. And we often stutter. We often fall. We often fail. And that's the biggest class of the reasons. So let's talk about aspirin. What's this new aspirin study show? I think this aspirin flip-flop is a little bit different than these other things because it's actually probably because the underlying substrate has actually changed. The initial randomized controlled trials of aspirin and prem prevention were successful, but that was a different person. It was a person who was an older person, smoker, thin, and aspirin seemed to work in that population. There wasn't a lot of statin use. Fast forward a few decades, now people are higher BMI, more likely to have diabetes, they're more likely to be on a statin. Does aspirin work in this setting? And in 2019, we wrote that paper, should medical therapies come with an expiration date? Because many of these changing patterns in our society may make some therapies that used to work no longer work. And that's a little bit different than reversal. It wasn't that we got it wrong, it was that the underlying substrate changed. But the failure, of course, is not continually reassessing our evidence base, not running these studies, testing, making sure it works in different contexts. In many other settings, it's likely that a practice that used to work no longer works, but we just don't know it because we've never tested it again. So aspirin is a different sort of class than medical reversal, but medical reversal certainly is real. And medical reversal far exceeds the uncertainty of statistics. If you ensured adequate, well-controlled, randomized studies before adopting costly new medical practices, you would dramatically reduce the rates of medical reversal. It wouldn't be nearly what it is today. So when I see people talk about this and they say, you know, Manny Rivers didn't get it right, didn't get it wrong. Okay, sure, he didn't get it wrong for his hospital, but no one really cared about just his hospital. We cared about all the other hospitals. And in that sense, the study was not very informative. It didn't predict what would happen there. Somebody might say, um, you know, some theory based on pathophysiology, like the Swan-Gantz catheter, it wasn't wrong. Well, yeah, actually, when you did a randomized controlled trial, the routine application of Swan-Gantz, you couldn't use it to leverage better outcomes. And over and over again, we see the same problem. The problem, of course, is with pills and IV drugs, you can adopt these based on insufficient evidence. I think we see that with the Exondis, the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy drug. We see this with aducanumab. But... It also goes beyond that. It goes beyond to multi-component procedural quality safety metrics, um, benchmarks, uh, incentive structures, all these things that are done to leverage better health outcomes seldom, if ever, come with randomized data. If I were to articulate what I think the biggest failure of the pandemic was, was that we did do a good job of running some randomized control trials of therapies. Um, We probably had too much off-label use while those trials were running. Um, just excessive off-label use that siphoned patients away from those studies. You can just think about that, um, the debacle of uh, the Mount Sinai investigators giving thousands of people anticoagulation outside of a randomized study prior to the randomized studies when they could have easily joined the randomized studies and actually answered the question much sooner. Sometimes the evidence came a little bit too late. In that case, you know, most of, uh, of, of, of the patients had already been in hospital and out of hospital before we started to learn with some of these new randomized trials which population benefits from aggressive anticoagulation and which benefits from usual standard of care anticoagulation. We did a good job with some of the therapies, but others like convalescent plasma, we treated way too many patients without getting the randomized evidence on where that might help, if at all. Dexamethasone was an early success story, but I think people didn't understand and they were somehow reluctant to embrace the early preprint results. Um, But when it comes to the non-pharmacological interventions, 
we failed catastrophically. The failure wasn't that we leapt on some things early on in the pandemic without credible evidence. That wasn't the failure at all. The failure was that while we were leaping onto things, we actively poisoned and didn't run cluster randomized control trials. We have just a paucity of them. Uh, uh, we've talked about Bangladesh on this channel. I think Bangladesh shows many of the challenges. It was done, but, uh, you know, it came very late. I mean, it came 18 months into the pandemic. It does show surgical masks was a winner, but cloth masks didn't win at all. But yet cloth masks were what we used to and still mandate. Actually, it's still the mask that most places are mandating. They're not mandating the surgical mask. Bangladesh, of course, applied to a place with essentially no pre-existing immunity and no vaccination. And we're extrapolating that to places like San Francisco with 80% vaccination. We're extrapolating that to places in the South with high vaccination plus maybe even high seroprevalence. We don't know. We're not good at documenting that. So these are all ways in which you go beyond the available evidence. And it's easy to believe that when you go beyond the available evidence, you're making the world a better place. The reality is often the odds are stacked against you and that these interventions are not going to work. So there are several categories of way medical science progresses. One is replacement. Um, a drug came along. It was better than no drug at all. And then a new drug comes along. It's better than the older drug. And we go in order, steady, stepwise, incremental progress. I think that's how many of us conceptualize biomedicine. There's another pathway that's often very common. It's where we weren't doing something. We were desperate. We were wish we could have something. And we had some pathophysiology, some theory, and we jumped on something new. Uh, years elapsed before brave investigators conduct randomized control trials and it turned out that something new was actually no better than doing nothing at all or doing whatever we did before. And that's a medical reversal. And then there's this other phenomenon that happened with aspirin, which was that we were doing something, we had good evidence, very likely it did help, but then the people changed over time. It was fundamentally a different group of people because of all these shifting changes in society, but we didn't reassess the evidence with the sort of time span we need. Maybe we're lucky we did it at all, and when we did it, found it didn't work, and then we had the flip-flop. The last one is more forgivable in my mind than the center one, than reversal. Reversal is not really forgivable for me because you know, I think, for maybe 50, 60 years that you really need to develop robust evidence. Um, and I think the real key insight into reversal, why it's so important, is that there have been many things in biomedicine that were really plausible, that we really thought worked, that people said, I will not randomize you to not doing it because I'm so confident it does work that when you actually test it explicitly, it did not work at all. In fact, increased death. And the classic example is the cardiac antiarrhythmic suppression study, uh, suppression trial CAST in the New England Journal of Medicine, which actually had an increased death rate from those class 1C antiarrhythmics. We detail many of these examples and many more in the book Ending Medical Reversal. We provide a coherent, I think, framework, philosophical framework for how to think about medical technologies. Science is complicated. Science will always have one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back, sorts of moments. But medicine is the application of science in pursuit of human health. And we can minimize the rate of these backward steps if we set some clear standards of evidence. And I think knowing the history of the flip-flops of medicine is important because it allows you to have some perspective about medical evidence. And in this pandemic, in particular, I think people who did not have this perspective were eager to champion interventions based on mechanistic science, retrospective observational data, confounded county by county, retrospective data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they didn't really understand that these types of data have such poor credibility. It's almost like no data at all in many cases. It's really almost at the level of credibility of nothing at all. Nothing at all has no credibility. And some of these studies are not much better than no credibility at all. You need to do credible studies if you wish to consider yourself an enlightened species, and I think that's what I struggle with. So, aspirin, not a medical reversal, but an important lesson. Medical reversal, very common, very problematic, sort of classic pitfalls that occur in the path to medical reversal. Exigent circumstances, yes, if you're in a dire straits, you can definitely do something for some period of time without medical evidence. I think no one will fault you for that, for things that are dire, for rare, for new things, but simultaneously, when those things persist, you have some commitment to developing robust evidence. And that commitment is in part because you know what you're doing is very likely to not actually work. I mean, that's the reality. And then the final thing to say is the pretest probability. The pretest talk about probability, the probability that anything someone dreams up will make people live longer, live better, it's very, very low in biomedicine. It's very, very low, not because I say it's very, very low, it's very, very low because biology has made it so. We are an exquisitely adapted species. It is very difficult to improve upon that adaptation, even in sickness and in health. 
there are a lot of people who have the compulsion, the will to believe that we can do something to interdict these processes and improve our outcomes and fate. That belief is often erroneous, exaggerated, false. It is a natural human compulsion. And so we see it over and over again. People who work in fields where they have more control over their domain, people who work in technology, they often come into biomedicine and they have so many questions like, why can't we just do this to get this problem to go away? But the truth is the biology, the complexity of the body is far more complex than your phone or your TV, your car, or your camera. It really is not fully explicable in terms of fundamental parts and components. It cannot be reduced, uh, at least not yet. And as long as that's the case, you need broad scale, empirical, large, simple, randomized control trials to filter the signal from the noise. Um, this is the single most important lesson of biomedicine. So if you like this video, like, subscribe, comment, leave a message, read the book, Ending Medical Reversal. I think it will give you a real perspective of flip-flops in biomedicine. These are just some thoughts I had when I was reading people talk about aspirin, and I don't think they've thought too much about how medical progress should occur. So until next time.